Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro closed the International Conference for the Bicentennial of the Battle of Pichincha. In the United States, at least 23 student, 18 students and 3 adults were killed in a shooting at a Texas elementary school. Brazilian officials reported that an anti-crime operation in Rio de Janeiro left 21 people dead on Tuesday. Hello, welcome to From the South. I'm Luis Alberto Matos from the Studios in Havana, Cuba. We begin with the news. The Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro closed the International Conference for the Bicentennial of the Battle of Pichincha, which was attended, among others, by historians from Cuba, Mexico, Ecuador, Bolivia, and Nicaragua. The event brought together national and international participants who debated on the importance and influence on current regional geopolitics of the victory that granted the definite independence to the Republic of Ecuador. The speakers agreed on the international nationalist character of this battle in addition to making visible the excluded people such as the indigenous Afro-descendants and women. The president highlighted the knowledge of the insurgent history as a transforming and creative force for the integration awareness in Latin America. It was our father Hugo Chavez who turned history into a living force a transforming force, a creative force of values, of conscience. Because if there is something we have today, it is the historical conscience that we are part of a process that goes much further back than what we know now, that brings more than 500 years of resistance. And if we know something very well today, is that we are part of something much bigger than any of us at an individual level. We are part of a great homeland, the Latin American Caribbean homeland, the South American homeland. Venezuela's President Nicolas Maduro accused Washington of being afraid to listen to the anti-imperialist voice of the peoples by trying to exclude Cuba, Venezuela and Nicaragua from what he called the summit of protest. The summit of the Americas is the summit of protest against imperialist exclusion. They are trying to exclude us because they are afraid of our anti-imperialist voice. They are afraid of the voice of the Bolivarians. They don't want the voice of Bolivar and Chavez to reach that meeting. But I tell you, whatever you do, the voice of Venezuela, the voice of Cuba, and the voice of Nicaragua will reach Los Angeles in the great protest of the people in Los Angeles. And our voice will be in that room. This I say, our voice will be present at the Los Angeles summit. No matter what the government of the United States says, we will be there with our truth. Magistrates of the National Electoral Council and the National Registrar in Colombia have confirmed that there won't be international audit of the presidential election software. The decision was reached after a meeting of more than three hours between two electoral entities. Magistrate Luis Guillermo Perez assured that the decision not to conduct an international audit will not affect next Sunday's presidential elections. The international audit had been requested by the parties and the National Electoral Council itself. The decision not to have an audit was taken five days before the presidential elections, which will be held on May 29th. In Colombia, the governing party, the Democratic Centro, said it would shred the peace accords. This policy left gaps on issues such as comprehensive rural reform, political reform, and the voluntary substitution of illicit crops. Our correspondent Hernán Tovar gives us the details. Manuel remained for 15 years in the ranks of the former FARC-EP guerrillas. He is one of the more than 13,000 combatants who joined the peace process in 2016. His dreams and his conviction a year before this agreement became a reality. 
made him imagine a new country where reconciliation is now the weapon of peace, reason for which he left the war behind. It means a very important moment for our country, the possibility that in Colombia we can talk to each other, that in Colombia we have the possibility to respect each other for thinking differently, but it also means great things for me as a person, like Manuel, and nice to be reunited with my family, to be reunited with my friends. They built this enterprise by joining forces with other ex-combatants. This project was created with a dream of making a company, initially brewing craft beer. This is the project, which is a cultural house, a restaurant, a cafeteria and a bar, which was fundamentally founded on the basis of the economic savings of the members of this project. We have not received any financial, logistical or training support from the government. The policies of Ivan Duque's government and his party have put an obstacle not only to this project but also to the desire of many to achieve peace. The Democratic Center's first challenge will be to tear up that damn paper that they call the final agreement with the FARC. This marked the route for the implementation of the peace accords in the hands of Ivan Duques between 2018 and 2022. Six crucial points that the government ignored and which prevented peace from being brought to the territories and a comprehensive rural reform that remains stagnant, as shown by the figures provided by the signatories themselves. I would say that less than 2% the distribution of those 3 million hectares that were agreed for farmers who do not have land or in the title of the 7 million hectares that farmers who even though have land do not have titles on them, and therefore marginalized from the regular economy and the political reform. The government has not been able in these four years to present a political reform project, which was agreed, and that will have guaranteed that at this moment that we are electing a new Congress and that will be electing a new president, there would not be so many doubts and critics. Another situation left by Duque's government is the lack of security guarantees for ex-combatants. During his administration, the number of homicides against signatories exceeded 180. What is not being done either with the FARC or with social leaders is to guarantee their lives. In the case of former FARC combatants, it is dramatic because the government knows who they are and know that they have security schemes, yet they have been assassinated. In addition to this scenario, other points of the peace accords are far from being fulfilled. The substitution of illicit crops have only reached 5.3% of the families linked to the program. According to the United Nations, drug production increased between 1,200 and 2,000 tons from 2020 and 2021, and while Duque defended his policy at the international level, more than 200 massacres were perpetrated, and between 2020 and 2020 alone, forced displacement affected close to 100,000 people, mostly Afro populations, farmers, and indigenous communities. We're taking a short break now. Join us again after this. Welcome back to From the South. Tuesday's shooting in the southern region of the United States is already the second deadly school shooting in the country's history. 19 school children, two teachers, and the perpetrator of this massacre are the latest victims of unstoppable gun violence. The drama of families is accompanied by the chaos that makes relatives and friends of those who were at Robb Elementary School in the city of Umvalde at the time of the attack wander through hospitals and reunification centers in the state of Texas as some children are still unaccounted for.
DNA tests to confirm the identity of the victims could take more than two days, but the list of the wounded are also unclear and the records in the reunification centers are apparently incomplete. In the face of this panorama, the U.S. president said he is fed up and calls for confronting arms lobbies. In the same context, Chris Murphy's Democratic senator from the state of Connecticut called for unity in the Senate and concrete action to prevent further violence at schools. I'm here on this floor to beg, to literally get down on my hands and knees and beg my colleagues. Find a path forward here. Work with us to find a way to pass laws that make this less likely. I understand my Republican colleagues will not agree to everything that I may support, but there is a common denominator that we can find. Brazilian officials reported that an anti-crime operation in Rio de Janeiro slum left 21 people dead Tuesday a year after the bloodiest ever favela raid in the city's history. Health officials put the toll at 20 with seven hospitalized with police counted another victim. A female bystander fell by a stray bullet. Military police said they came under gunfire as they approached the northern Rio slum of Col Villa Cruzeiro in the early morning hours with the mission of locating and arresting criminal leaders. Villa Cruzeiro, a favela crowded onto a hillside not far from Rio de Janeiro's international airport, was also the scene of a violent confrontation in February when police killed eight people. Another massacre, the second in the Peña complex of favelas during the government of Claudio Castro. And we also had one in Jacarezinho Salgueiro in Sao Gonzalo's, as well as other favelas. It is truly shocking. I think that we cannot normalize that the state enters a favela and leaves it with 20 dead people, or more, since we still have no idea of the total, because there are still bodies in the woods yet to be retrieved. We just don't know what the final tally is. Since taking office, Brazil's far-right president, Jair Bolsonaro, cut housing spending by 98 percent, so thousands of families are taking matters into their own hands and occupying abandoned government buildings. In Recife, our correspondent Brian Meyer expands on this. With Brazil's housing crisis exacerbated by rising poverty levels caused by the far-right Bolsonaro administration's neoliberal structural adjustments, an estimated 6 million Brazilians now lack access to adequate housing. But homeless families are organizing and fighting back. We decided to occupy because this building has been abandoned for a long time. We want the government to come here, see the situation we are living in, and take action. There are homeless families from all over Brazil living here. With millions of potential housing units available in Brazil's vacant buildings, social movements organize to occupy them, then demand that the government guarantee their legal right to dignified housing by converting them to apartments and ceding collective ownership. A recent example is Maria Ferminha dos Reis, a two-month-old occupation in Recife which is already home to 250 people. I have never been in this kind of situation before, but I thank God we are here and it's different than I imagined. It's well organized. It all depends on us. We help each other out so that things work out as well as possible. Activists from the MTST hope that eventually all the vacant buildings in Recife can be occupied so that the city's poor can not only realize their constitutional right to dignified housing, but have easy access to all of the benefits of living downtown currently enjoyed by the middle class. There's a lot of homeless families here in Pernambuco, but there are 43 abandoned buildings in downtown Recife alone. This government building has been vacant for 20 years. Ryan Mir. Tell us, sir, Recife.
On Tuesday, Russian mining specialists are working near the seaport of Mariupol to clear the area. The Russian Ministry of Defense indicated that the mining works are carried out by specialists of the International Mine Action Center. The Russian army deactivated about 12,000 explosive devices installed on the coastal territory of the Sea of Azov near the port of Mariupol. The governmental entity pointed out that the military personnel in charge of the operation also removed from the port territory several sunken ships and objects obstructing navigation on the approaches of the port. Russian authorities sent heavy machinery to start reconstruction work in the territory of the Donbass. The Russian government held talks with the leader of the self-proclaimed Donetsk People's Republic, Denis Pushilin, with the aim of fine-tuning the details of the Russian nation's support for the reconstruction of the territory of the Donbass. Moscow informed about the first shipment of heavy machinery for the recovery of roads and bridges destroyed during the fighting. Pushilin expressed his hope that the delivery of the machines will be completed as soon as possible. Russian Defense Ministry said on Tuesday that Russia's Air Force conducted a joint recon mission with its Chinese counterparts over the Asia-Pacific region. The commander-in-chief of Russia's Aerospace Forces, Sergei Surovikin, said that an air group consisting of Russian strategic missile carriers TU-95MC and Chinese CN-6H strategic bombers carried out air patrols over the waters of the Sea of Japan and the East China Sea. Surovikin expressed that both nations had taken part in the exercise in accordance with the provisions of international law and without any violations of the airspace of foreign states. The joint mission comes as South Korean officials said on Tuesday that the country had scrambled fighter jets when Russian and Chinese warplanes entered the Korea Air Defense Identification Zone. In the course of carrying out the task, the aircraft of our countries act strictly in accordance with the provisions of international law. There are no violations of the airspace of foreign states. The joint patrol is a planned event and is not aimed against third countries. And we have more news coming up after the final short break, so don't go away. Welcome back to From the South. U.S. Energy Secretary Jennifer Granholm announced another 40 million barrels to be released from the Petroleum Reserve. Granholm made the announcement while touring by Ushokto, a strategic petroleum reserve in Louisiana. The White House announced at the end of March that President Joe Biden ordered the daily release of 1 billion barrels of oil from the strategic petroleum reserve for the next six months. Biden will also ask Congress to penalize oil and gas companies that lease public land but are not producing energy. The Strategic Petroleum Reserve is a collection of underground salt caverns in Texas and Louisiana that can hold more than 700 million oil barrels. The reserve was created after the 1970s Arab oil embargo to give the United States a supply that could be used in emergency. On Tuesday, Chair Joanna Homegraver Sales, the incumbent director of General of the World Health Organization, was reappointed to a second five-year term by the 75th World Health Assembly. Chair was the sole candidate this year in his first remarks after his re-election. Chair said he appreciated the WHO family for their hard work and thanked the WHO member states for their trust. He said his priorities were health promotion, primary health care, emergency preparedness and response and science, innovation and digital health. During his first term, Terros carried out transformations in the WHO to increase its effectiveness and impact at global level. He also guided the multilateral response to the COVID-19 pandemic, the Ebola outbreaks in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and other humanitarian crises in several countries. United Nations Deputy Secretary General Amina Mohamed urged Monday to do more especially for the most vulnerable and to incorporate disaster risk in how we live, build and invest. The statement was made at the Malta Hazard Early Warning Conference which is being held in Bali, Indonesia. To do more, especially for the most vulnerable, to incorporate disaster risk in how we live, build and invest. A people-centered early warning system combined with early action will save lives and empower individuals and communities to act in timely and appropriate manners. 
This approach reduces the likelihood of loss of lives, personal injury and illness, and damage to property, assets and the environment. Former Pakistani Prime Minister Imran Khan called for a march in Islamabad. Khan, who was Prime Minister for three and a half years, was removed from office by a vote in Parliament that had the support of all major political parties. He has since given speeches in several locations calling for support for a march in the capital on Wednesday. Khan called on the authorities not to oppose the march. He insisted that once his supporters get there, they will not move until Parliament is dissolved and new elections are called. Interior Minister Rana Sanogala warned Khan supporters against causing trouble during the march and accused Khan of misleading the youth and manipulating them for his political ends. Khan claimed Washington orchestrated his removal in retaliation for his pro Russia and China foreign policies. U.S. State Department denies any involvement in the, mar in the matter. And we have come to the end of this news brief. Remember, you can find these and many other stories on our website at telesoreenglish.net. You can also join us on our social media on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Telegram. For Telesore English, I'm Luis Alberto Matos. Thank you for watching.